Excuse me, uh, we're going to start. It's a long session and we're going to be going through dinner if we're not careful. Uh, this is to invite, uh, welcome you to our union session on the consequences of this unusual sunspot minimum. We're going to be hearing papers on various aspects of the minimum, including uh, luminosity and history and energetic particles right to the present. So let me call the first paper, which is Solar Magnetic Field and Irradiance, How Unusual is the Current Minimum, given by Solanke. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by asking the question, why should we give a damn? Why should we study the current minimum? What do we hope to learn? Now, there are a number of things that we hope to learn from that. And the first is, if we want to understand, and if we want to find out if the sun influences the Earth's climate in any significant way, then we need to know what the solar irradiance has been doing in the past, and not just its cyclic variation, but also if there is a secular trend and by how much it has changed between, for example, the Maunder Minimum and now. If you want to understand what is causing any long-term change of the irradiance, we need to know what the magnetic field has been doing, if that shows any secular trends. The structure of the field and its evolution, its interaction with motions in the sun's interior or surface, for example, with convection, drives not just the irradiance, but many other things also, solar activity, the structure temperature of the corona, and even properties of the heliosphere. As a little side effect, or as a big side effect, the present minimum will provide us, or hopefully will provide us information, new ways of testing dynamo theory and trying to understand how the magnetic field is generated and what causes its evolution. And as a final side effect, we have learned something also about the sociology of solar physics, of how mature our science is. One of the definitions of a maturity of a science is that one can make predictions. And to my knowledge, at least, there was no serious prediction about what this minimum was like, which puts us in about the same ballpark as economists. Now, that's a pretty worrisome thought, I think. So let's move ahead to the question, how unusual is the present minimum? And I'm just going to talk about global properties here. Right? There are many details which are different, but let's just look at the big picture, so to say. What you see on this diagram is in the last 45 years, the heliospheric magnetic flux, which is the thick blue line, and if you follow it, you'll find that in the last couple of years, it's been lower than at any time in the last 45 years, which is basically the whole space age. That's the period of time where we could measure it. And so definitely unusual, but that's not a very long period of time. If you want to go much further back, then you need another proxy, and sunspots are a good one. We have 400 years of that. And if you look at the number of sunspots, that's the shading, the light blue shading in this diagram, also for the same period of time, the last four cycles. In the present minimum, we have had 762 spotless days as of December 1st. And this is way more than any of the previous eight minima before that. It's more than twice the average number that we have had in these previous eight minima. So yes, indeed, the current minimum is unusual. However, if you go further back in time, the four minima before that, let's say the second half of the 19th century, this was not unusual at all. Yeah. 
We have had, in those four minima, you have had similar numbers or even more spotless days during a given minimum. So it's an unusual minimum, yes, but it's not an unusually unusual minimum. If we go closer to the sun, then we expect the heliospheric field to be driven basically by the magnetic field at the poles of the sun. And this is a diagram that you have seen if you were in the session on, Wednesday, uh, on, on Monday afternoon, um, like the previous one as well. Uh, what's shown here is as a function of time from 1976 till now, the polar magnetic field of the sun as measured by Wilcox Solar Observatory. And the minima are given by these extrema, right? The horizontal line in the middle is zero. And you see that at the current minimum, the polar field is only about half as strong as it was in the three previous minima. So again, unusual, but again, not a very long period of time that we are comparing with. And this is consistent. You know, having it about half as strong in the polar field is very much consistent with having a heliospheric field, which is also roughly half as strong as it was in the previous few minima. Let's move on to the solar irradiance. The total solar irradiance, that means the brightness of the sun as a whole integrated over all wavelengths. Now that's a much more tricky thing to measure. And it's also difficult for a longer period of time because you don't have measurements from the same instrument and you have to put them together. And depending who does that, they get somewhat different results. So what I'm showing you here is a composite put together by Klaus Fröhlich, the Davos composite, and you can see that in the period of time since measurements started in 1978, there have been three cycles roughly. You see the three maxima, you see the three minima. The first two minima were at about the same level. The present minimum is lower by about 0.28 watts per square meter compared to the others. Just for comparison, the amplitude of the solar cycle in the, in the total solar irradiance is about one watt per square centimeter. So again, a new development there compared to what we had in the previous couple of cycles. Finally, let's consider the total magnetic flux of the sun integrated over the whole solar disk or just looking at the center of the solar disk. And we find that in the present minimum, the amount of solar flux, magnetic flux, is only about 60% what it was in the minimum of 1996-97, even if you exclude the poles. So it's not just this open flux at the poles which has changed, but it's actually the very structure of the magnetic field. In the quiet sun, the amount of field you have in the network is considerably lower now than it was before. Now, this fits in quite well also with the fact that the irradiance is lower, because using this, this, this lower average magnetic flux that we have on the sun also implies that there will be a reduced total solar irradiance, so they fit together very well, and that, again, confirms previous, um, previous results that the total solar irradiance variations are indeed caused by the magnetic field at the solar surface, which contradicts a recent paper by Klaus Fröhlich, but he didn't actually compare the magnetic field with the irradiance. He compared the magnesium index with the irradiance and found that they diverge recently, but if you look at the magnetic field itself, you find that it goes very well with the irradiance. Now, the important thing, the thing I find most exciting from all of this is that for the first time, we are seeing a secular change in very basic parameters of the sun, in the total magnetic flux, in the open magnetic flux, in the irradiance. This is something we have been discussing for you know, a decade or two even, but now we actually have direct measurements showing us that. That, I think, is the most exciting thing to have come out of this minimum. Now, can we explain such secular change? Yes, indeed, there is a mechanism. And it's based on having overlapping solar cycles. Okay. So if you look at the, the upper diagram for a moment, you see the individual dashed green curves as a function of time 
would be the amount of magnetic flux which is emerging at the solar surface and if two solar cycles overlap in the sense that flux is still emerging in the old cycle while it has started emerging in the new one the magnetic flux will never drop to zero between them so you'll get a minimum where you have a certain amount of flux and depending on whether the next cycle is strong or weak whether it peaks early or late the level at which you will have magnetic flux in the minima will be higher or lower and you can get secular variations of this type. There are different variants of this, but that's the basic idea, okay? Overlapping cycles. You can then use this, <clears throat> make a simple model, put this in a few differential equations, and starting from sunspot number, we had shown already a number of years ago that you can produce secular variations in the total, in the open flux, and in the irradiance as well. Now, very recently, uh, in a paper together with Luis Vieira, uh, we have improved on the model, we have extended it by distinguishing between rapidly and so slowly decaying flux. It doesn't change anything in the very basics, but what it does is it improves um, the correspondence with the observations. And just an example, you see in the lower diagram the total magnetic flux, the total time series that is available to us starting in the 1960s with Mount Wilson and then Wilcox and uh, Kitt Peak coming in as well. So these are the colored symbols. Those are the measurements. The black line is what the model gives. And in particular, if you look at the last few years, the model agrees very well with the data, even in this time when the flux has fallen to lower values than we had before. And the nice thing is that we did not use this period of time to constrain the model's free parameters, right? We stopped there where that vertical blue line is at around 2001. Uh, so the rest is just what comes out of the model, and it agrees quite well with the data. <clears throat> you can do the same thing for the open flux, which is given in the upper diagram where we are comparing the model, which is the blue curve, I think, with the reconstructions of the open flux by Mike Lockwood and co-workers, which is the black curve. Uh, in the lower diagram is the comparison with the irradiance. In both cases, where the open flux has fallen low and the irradiance has gone down, the model is going along with the data. Again, we didn't use this most recent period to constrain the model. Now, if you listen carefully two slides ago, you will be wondering now, what did they do about cycle 24? Because remember, we are talking of overlapping cycles. What we did about cycle 24, because we don't know how strong it will be, we just assumed there is no cycle 24. So there is no cycle 24 in this model, and the model then reproduces the data extremely well. Does that mean we are going to go into a Maunder minimum-like event? I don't think so. This is not the most precise way to make predictions for the next cycle, okay? But what it is suggesting to us, I'm not saying it's telling us, what's suggesting to us is that cycle 24 will either be weak or it will peak late or some combination of these, okay? Now, if we assume that the model is not doing too badly, since it does reproduce the data quite well, we can then compare where we are compared to the period of the Maunder minimum. We can go back all the way where we have sunspot data, 400 years, or 300 years in this case, have just plotted since the end of the Maunder minimum. And you see, yes, the flux has fallen quite a way, but it is nowhere near there where, at least according to the model, it would be um, in, in a Maunder minimum-like state. We haven't even reached if you look at the lower diagram, it shows the open flux. We haven't even reached the levels where, according to the model, we would have been in the Dalton minimum around 1800 when there were a few very weak cycles and the open flux and also the total flux were very low. So basically, we are at the level of around the 19th century, which is interesting because also the minimum as far as the sunspots are concerned is also like the minima that we had during the 19th century. Okay, 
and come to the conclusions. The current minimum has demonstrated that both the magnetic field, the total flux, the open flux, whatever, and the irradiance display secular variations. I think this is an extremely important result. This is something that we have been discussing for years, for decades. There were indirect indications for that. Now, finally, we have direct proof, direct measurements that this is the case. What I'm quite happy and relieved about is that even the simple models that we have uh, constructed for the evolution of the magnetic flux reproduce the data relatively well, including this unusual present minimum that we have, although this was nothing that we tweaked the model to do. It came out naturally. And finally, the behavior of the present minimum suggests that the sun is returning to an activity level compared to what we had in the 19th century. Or, even beyond that, not just the 19th century, but actually during most of the Holocene. The diagram you see here is the number of sunspots, or the sunspot number, reconstructed from carbon-14 data over the last 7,000 years. We have put in two different bars, the blue one at the bottom, whenever the sunspot number fell below that value, we said the sun is now in a grand minimum state. You see there were a number of these grand minima, but there have also been times when the sunspot number was very high over those red values when there were grand maxima. And the last 50, 60 years has definitely been a grand maximum, one of the strongest ones we have had. And it looks like the sun is now leaving that grand maximum. Where it's going to, I don't know. I think we have really exciting times ahead of us. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not better than a con So the question was if in the next year the flux would, would to go down to the level of the Maunder minimum, what would be my prediction for the next cycle? Oh, I don't think I would dare to make a prediction. Uh, I am definitely not as good as the economists are. Okay, um, you see from the graph that there is no, yes, I'm repeating the question, that there is no grand maximum around 1,000? Yes, well, yeah, you have seen correct. There is no grand maximum around 1,000 according to this data set, right? This is one data set of carbon-14, which was put together by a whole bunch of groups, but there are also beryllium data, which don't look exactly the same. So you will find, you know, differences in detail, but you will still see the same picture that you have grand maxima and grand minima. And the current, the last 50, 60 years is a grand maximum. Any other questions? If not, thank you. There was one more there. Was there. One over there. I'm sorry. The question is if this diagram here helped, uh, no? Okay, the question is, there is a debate about what the, the TSI composites, there are three different ones which differ from each other, and the question was if the current minimum is helping to distinguish between them. Well, it helps to distinguish between them only if you believe that the model has anything to do with reality. If it does, then yes indeed, it does support the Davos composite, but no, no, that's all I want to say. I don't want to say the model is better than the data. Okay, we'll go on to the next uh, speaker. Next speaker is Ken McCracken. Good 
giving a talk, The Effects of Low Solar Activity Upon the Cosmic Radiation of the Interplanetary Magnetic Field Over the Last 10,000 Years and Implications for the Future. This is an invited talk. Thank you, Randy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my we'll pleasure to be here. here. We'll let you know uh, say again? We'll let you know after 15 minutes. No. We'll give you a warning after 15 minutes. Thanks. Yes. Um, Professor Solanke has given us a good introduction. The sun is currently doing something which we haven't seen it do before. My job is to talk about the extent to which historical records will tell us whether it has done it before, how often, and what we might learn to expect. Um, where's the... Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, the uh, outline of the paper is before you. It will be based on the paleocosmic ray record, which is um, based on a number of cosmogenic nuclides. I will explain that a little bit because in the last 10 years, the whole story of the um, cosmogenic nuclides has changed very greatly. And I want you to just understand where we are now in that. I will look at the last 10, 1,100 years to get a, um, a feel for what we might expect. I'll use 10,000 years to get statistics, and then we'll talk about a few other issues. Next, please. Very briefly, the data is obtained from uh, a process which happened back in the past when a cosmic ray whacked into the top of the atmosphere. It produced a cascade of protons and neutrons these interacted with ox oxygen and nitrogen and argon atoms. Spallation pr processes then were archived in ice. There was a parallel path through carbon-14, which I will mention briefly a little later. There's another process entirely whereby very intense cosmic radiation from solar flares can produce um, nitrates in the polar atmosphere, which are also sequestered in um, ice cores. And that gives us a method of looking at the paleocosmic ray solar flare occurrence. Next, please. Let me just explain where we have come from in the last 10 years in respect of the paleocosmic ray data. Ten years ago, we, we knew that there were variations in the carbon-14 and the beryllium-10, but we couldn't relate them to our experimental measurements with neutron monitors or with the satellites. Uh, in that ten years, we've come forward in a number of directions. First of all, the satellite measurements have given us a much better understanding of the manner in which the solar activity changes the spectrum of the cosmic rays. We have used very large mathematical models uh, to s simulate the nucleonic cascade in the atmosphere, which produces protons and neutrons, which, and then have used nuclear cross-sections to estimate the manner in which production of the cosmogenic nucleides uh, depends on energy. In other words, we are developing the relationship between incoming flux and the production of the nucleides. There's one major issue still remaining, which is then how those nucleides, which are produced both in the stratosphere and the troposphere, are sequestered in ice. Our large um, global circulation models in the last several years have answered those questions. So we now can quite accurately uh, intercalibrate the uh, paleocosmic ray records with the modern era. And that's what I will be doing now. Next, please. But just to give you an idea of what this is telling us, there we have the relative response of the neutron monitors, which are well known, which you can see have peak energy response at about 5 GeV. The William 10 that I will be using in a moment uh, has a peak response in the vicinity of 1 GeV, sort of midway between 
the neutron monitors and the um, higher energy uh, spacecraft measurements on IMP and such spacecraft. So we can see now how the beryllium-10 and the carbon-14 are more sensitive to long and short-term changes than neutron monitors. More important, we have the uh, interconversion calibrations, which I now use. Next, please. Just very quickly, of course, to define the terms which uh, you all probably know, the uh, gra solar grand minima are occurrences such as occurred during the Maunda minima, 1650 to 1715, the Dalton and the Gleisberg minimum of uh, 1900. Next, please. So now let's look at what the paleocosmic rays were doing during those minima. We're going to look primarily at the minima. And look at the um, one for the more than the minimum. You, you can see that the uh, cosmic ray flux, look at the south pole in the middle there. I better have the, uh, where's the, the, uh, um, the pointer? Oh, great, thanks, yes. Uh, Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, looking at the middle panel uh, here, um, that from the South Pole you can see that on the far right, the current intensity is about half of what it was during the Maunder minimum. We can see that during the Dalton and the Maunder and also 1900, the intensity was considerably higher uh, that is the amount of beryllium-10 or the cosmic rays were considerably higher and it was, you can see there were similar events earlier called the Wolf and the Oort minima which we know were per periods of low solar activity because there were low aurora uh, recorded in the old history records of um, Europe. Now let's those data are averaged over 22 years, so they've averaged over the 11-year cycle. Let's have the next one, please, Joe. Here we now have the um, paleocosmic ray data for um, the last 600 years, where we can see the 11-year variation. You can see there is substantial variation through the whole period. You can see yet again that the um, um, intensity was high during the Maunder and so on. The question I want to look at now is to what extent was the sun still varying the cosmic radiation flux during the big minima? That is, was there still a varying magnetic field? Was there still varying modulation? Um, next slide, please. Now, this is a spur of minimum, which is the most profound minimum we've had in the last thousand years. It lasted about a hundred years, 120, and you can see that the modulation, the variation, continued through that whole period. It was a sub quite substantial variation. We in the cosmic ray community have something called a modulation potential, which is not a very good measurement, but it, it, it's a parameter anyhow that gives you something. You, it was a roughly 200 MEV modulation function change. This was a substantial variation. It tells us that the magnetic fields were uh, varying substantially, certainly on a 22-year periodicity, with, uh, but the 11-year was there as well. Next slide, please. So now we know that the cosmic ray intensity was high during um, periods of low solar activity. Uh, we have seen five of them in the last thousand years. Let's now look at the last 10,000 years. Here we have at the top the beryllium-10 production record, at the bottom the carbon-14. There are differences. Uh, there's an important issue here that the manner in which they are stored, one in ice and the other in trees, are quite different and the noise terms in each are different from each other. 
So by combining them, getting the production signal out of them, we can get rid of most of the noise, and that's what we do now. I do point out that the, the uh, glaciologists put time the wrong way for us. And so note here that it is time before present. Um, a long time ago was on the right, now is on the left. And just to remind you of that, I have time on the, the time arrow henceforth. So combining these data, next slide please, this is then the 10,000 year cosmic ray record. There's the spur minimum. The, um, the core did not have the maunder in it. It, it, was, uh, it didn't start till it was down about uh, 1500 AD. The most important thing to notice, I think, is that there are about 22 maunder minimum or spur minimum type events. That is, the sun does this frequently. And these are the big ones. There are smaller ones down in this grass here. The red line is at the present situation. And just for reference, these low values through here are because the geomagnetic moment was about 20% higher then than now. So that's showing us both what the cosmic rays were doing. But just as a check, you can see what the geomagnetic field was doing. Next, please. Now I'm going to change quickly uh, to, um, very briefly, the question of solar energetic particle events. The paleocosmic ray record does include such signals. Uh, the largest one known is the Carrington event up at the top. During the Gleisberg cycle, and the Gleisberg minimum, that's one of the low grand minima, it's not quite a grand minima, but uh, around about 1900, there is a burst of very large uh, solar energetic particle events. Some, um, including a couple that are not on there, from, there were some eight large events. One of them, the second largest in the whole record. Very, um, and so here we have very substantial production by the sun. If we go back to the Dalton minimum, we find just the same bunching of production of solar energetic particles. And there are theories about this. I won't go into it now because my time's running out, so we'll move on to the next one. Using Parker's uh, transport equation, we can make approximations, I stress approximations, as to what the magnetic field at the orbit Earth was doing. And here's the estimate for the last six, 600 years, a steadily ramping up intensity with 11 year modulation on top of it, going up to the 5.2 at solar minimum that we've observed until recently. And of course, it's now down to where the second arrow is. So this would suggest that the magnetic field is beginning to reverse downwards. Next, please. If we look at the last 10,000 years, this is an estimate by uh, Freedom Iron Helber for that period. Um, no time is going the right way this time. Um, the, the, this, we can see the grand minima. The one I want to point to is the bottom curve, which is showing us that there's a, a long-term variation of periods period 2,200 years. This was deducted by, uh, detected by Chuck Sonnet 30 years ago. But this is the first time we've ever known what its phase is. You can see here that it was a minimum, and in fact it is defined by the bunches of grand minima that occur. And so the, the Maunder minimum, the Spora minimum, cause that low value there. This tells us that that cycle is probably a quarter of its way through to the next minimum in 2,000 years' time, which is suggesting, as I'll show in a minute, that we certainly are not going to have another more minimum. Next slide, please. So let us summarize um, where, what our historic record has told us as to um, what's happening now. 
First of all, it has suggests to us that um, reductions in solar activity, such as are occurring in this minimum, have occurred quite frequently in the past. Very large reductions, such as the Maunder or Spera minimum, are roughly once every 500 years, but a bit clumped. The smaller ones, once every 100. And so on, you can see that the cosmic radiation fluxes are high, the durations of these events are one to five solar cycles and so on. And I won't dwell on that anymore because um, it allows some time. But finally, and I stress that the next slide should not, my co-authors uh, should not be blamed for the next slide. This is me and me only saying if I look at the data, if I look at the paleocosmic ray records, what do I say is about to happen? So there's the prediction through looking at the paleocosmic ray record. A Maunder minimum is most unlikely because of the Holstead periodicity that I mentioned. The Dalton minimum is my bet because what I didn't point out was that there's a periodicity in the records. There's a very clear and quite fixed 208 year periodicity uh, at the debris cycle. And this, to me, we're just about 208 years from the Dalton. The event like 1900 is possible, and a non-event is, by my counting, not likely. Thank you. Next one. Oh. And that is thank you. Shut them up. Yeah. <laughs> but, thank you. Right. I, uh, I would like to talk today about the phenomenon known as the torsion oscillation and how it relates to the solar minimum. Uh, next slide, please. So as a brief introduction to those of you who are not familiar with this, the, the torsional oscillation, so-called, is a pattern of migrating zonal flows that sort of appear around in mid-latitudes um, before the beginning of the solar cycle, and during the solar cycle they migrate down towards the equator. Um, and this was first discovered by Howard and Labonte back in 1980 um, in surface Doppler measurements at Mount Wilson, where they've been following it ever since. And from helioseismology, using sound waves to probe the interior of the sun, we've been able to observe what this torsional oscillation does within the whole of the bulk of the convection zone for 14 years now going on. And so what does this tell us about uh, what might be going on with uh, cycle 24? Next. Okay, so th this plot shows a, the torsional oscillation pattern near the surface as a function of latitude and time, beginning with the beginning of gong observations in 1995. Um, so the, the red-yellow is rotating faster than the average at, that, at each location, and the blue-green is rotating slower. And you can see these, slow, these fast bands migrating down towards the equator. So we started just before the minimum of the previous cycle, and you can follow that band right through. Um, now can you just hit the key again, Joe, please? No, uh, well, just, just oh. yeah, there we go. <laughs> Got an overlay. Um, so I overlaid uh, contours of the unsigned magnetic field strength from Kitt Peak on top of that. So there's your magnetic butterfly, and you can see how it relates to the, the movement, how, how the flows relate to the migration of the activity. So um, 
Do we have some kind of a pointer? Yes. Uh, right oh, right, okay. Um, this, yeah, okay. So you can see that along the equatorward edge of the uh, fast belt, they kind of defines the equatorward limit of the activity, and the um, the poleward edge sort of runs along the uh, sort of maximum activity, as Dick Altrock has pointed out in a different context. And these observations go all the way through to last week, thanks to Jesper Sko, who uh, very kindly expedited the processing of the most recent MDI data and uh, sent me the data about dinner time on Friday. And uh, so, uh, next slide, well, well, next, yeah. Okay, so those lines, the vertical lines represent, the, this line on the, on the right represents the position of the flows in the, um, that best correspond to where we were at the beginning of the observations, a year before minimum. And the, sec the line on the left corresponds to where the flows were at the most recent observations which is round, corresponds to an epoch of about uh, mid to late 1997. And if you see, you know, by then we were beginning to see some activity from cycle 23, but not very much. And the other thing I should like you to notice is that, talking of overlapping solar cycles, um, we started to see this branch for cycle 24 you know, back in uh, as early as 2004 or thereabouts. So, uh, whether this oscillate, whether this pattern is a tracer or a driver of the dynamo, um, it certainly doesn't depend on the f activity being right there. Next, please. Okay, so you can try to estimate the length of the cycle either by fitting it with a sinusoidal function to the rotation rate or by just looking at the correlation, just doing correlation analysis of the um, um, the, the flow configuration near the surface. And you can see that as you sort of add in more and more data starting from about 2007, the uh, effective length of the cycle has been gradually increasing. And we published this, in, this plot in about six months ago in AppJ Letters. And since then we've added two or three more points. And it seems to have leveled off for a little bit over 12 years. It doesn't seem to be stretching out any longer. So things do seem to be on the move. Next. Okay. Now, as the whole advantage of having heliosismology is that we can see what's going on below the surface in the convection zone. And here I show um, a slice through the sun. I have to remember that these uh, helioseismic measurements are... Um, by construction, symmetrized about the equator, we can't distinguish between north and south hemispheres. There are other ways of doing that. So we can see um, in, the, in the left plot is sort of a little before the previous minimum, and uh, the right plot is um, about a year after the previous minimum, and you can see that this band has shifted downwards. Next. Yes. Okay, and this is uh, similarly... Um, in the, the current minimum, th this is in late 2007, so there's your band coming in, some kind of stuff in the middle of the convection zone, and by now, or very recently, we, we have a quite strong band established and sitting at um, around 20 to 30 degrees. So th from that point of view, the correspondence um, does seem to go all the way uh, down to the bottom of the convection zone though you notice that in the previous minimum there was a little more going on at the equator because the previous cycle had not entirely vanished on us yet. Okay, next. Okay, now one thing when I talk about this, um, people look at these plots and they look at the high latitudes and they say what's going on with that. So I thought I'd show you some plots of the residuals after subtraction of the mean rotation rate as a function of time at the higher latitudes where the, where the poleward branch of the Tosnan oscillation pattern is. So that's at 45 degrees where it's kind of messy. The, the red and blue point, the blue points are gong and the red points are from MDI. Next. And at 52 and a half degrees, what you notice apart from that very first point, 
that the sun now, the, the rotation rate at that latitude is slower than it has been any time in the last 14 years, um, or, or was a couple of years ago. Next. Um, as you go up, the signal starts to get stronger because there's a lot less uh, mass and angular inertia to move around. And, uh, and we see, you know, it's a quite a nice triangle wave and it's come back to about where it was. Um, next. Yes. Uh, 67 and a half degrees. And I think, you know, this is sort of starting to tell us that things are, you know, a little complicated, but there's some periodicity in there and it seems to be repeating. Next, more or less. Okay, and there at 75 degrees, we have what looks like a nice, tidy, uh, triangular wave thing. And uh, next. Okay, if you measure that, that measure off from there. Um, next. Okay, you can kind of see. Uh, and then and the next, just, just to measure off, that's about a 12-year period in there. So, you know, at 75 degrees, things are trucking along on about a 12-year schedule, nothing apparently. Anyway, next. So, okay, now, to put this into some historical context, I plotted the, um, the observations by Roger Ulrich um, from the Mount Wilson 150-foot tower as a function of time and latitude, and next, okay, overlaid the butterfly diagram, next, symmetrized the whole thing to co correspond to the uh, helioseismic observations, next, and then overlaid the helioseismology on top of the, the more recent cycle. So you can see that we have nearly you know, three and a half cycles there, and each time this, the, pattern, the same pattern with the relation between the position of the flows and the position of the butterfly diagram. And next. And then if you draw the, the best correspondence to that most recent data point, that, that crops up here and here and here. And the next, the uh, spacings between those are about 12 years um, something under 10 years and a bit over 10 years. And if you look at where those, verti I'm nearly done, those vertical lines fall on the uh, plot, um, you can see that in the last three cycles, we were beginning to get some activity by then. And indeed, if you look over on the right, you can see a couple little wiggles. We are getting a little bit of activity now. And in fact, I just would like to point out that today is not a spotless day. And in fact, we had two quite respectable C-class flares. <laughs> in the last 24 hours, but okay, that's, uh, that's it. So you can excite scientists when nothing happens as well as when something happens. I think that's the moral of this story. Uh, the sun is clearly doing an experiment and those of us who work in the interplanetary medium are seeing the results of it as well. And so uh, Randy and Joe and... <laughs> The co-organizers have asked me to tell you about the interplanetary side of the story. So the, uh, the familiar sunspots and their associated time series and spatial patterns, the butterfly diagrams are only uh, the tip of the iceberg, of course. This is only the superficial part of the solar cycle. Uh, we, uh, we are progressing in our fields to the point where there are solar dynamo models, uh, such as this one uh, from the Goddard uh, Scientific Visualiz uh, Visualization Center of uh, a new model that's out that uses helioseismic data to model the interior convection of the sun and wind up toroidal fields and produce poloidal fields that poke out of the surface and produce the surface fields. So we are 
getting better all the time in our ability to understand uh, the origins of what we're seeing on the surface. Uh, but magnetograms uh, reveal the details that we care about ultimately in the interplanetary medium. And uh, what we have to remember is that the sunspots and all those things we count and track back in time are not the whole story. That if you look at a magnetogram during solar maximum, for example, on the left, uh, you see that there are magnetic fields uh, that are concentrated that are not appearing in the white light or continuum images at the top. Uh, the images on the right, by the way, are uh, recent images uh, before the new appearance of the sunspots. Uh, we understand where these active regions come from to some degree. Uh, they, the flux seems to, from the dynamo activity seems to emerge in uh, concentrated regions on the sun. Uh, it erupts from the subsurface. The left-hand images show the magnetograms and white light images as well as a couple of filtered uh, wavelengths and a simulation of an erupting, emerging uh, active region from below the photosphere is, is illustrated on the right. Now, these emerged active region fields disperse and decay on the surface of the sun on time scales of days to months. Uh, the current understanding is that the surviving flux that's swept to the poles determines the largest scale fields in the corona that affect the interplanetary medium and also are responsible for the polarity reversals that we see. Better, thank you. Uh, the uh, helioseismology and solar surface observations together have revealed the responsible motions for these activities. We have the differential rotation on the left. In the middle, the uh, meridional circulation in the convection zone is a key player. And then there's a shallow convection pattern uh, due to granulation and supergranulation that's causing a diffusive kind of motion of that surface field as well. And by the way, that's instrumental in bringing positive and negative fields that have emerged together and doing uh, cancellation and removal of, of flux from the surface. Now what we end up with is a solar field that combines large and small scales. Uh, there's a, the largest the dipolar contribution illustrated on the right and the smaller scales from the active regions uh, can make many high orders of spherical harmonic contribution. And what we end up with are maps of this kind of the global field of the sun which are really what we care about in the interplanetary medium. These are the boundary conditions on the corona, and these are the things that map out, and these are the things that cause us to have uh, positive and negative fields in the heliosphere and open and closed field regions that are arising from certain portions of the sun. And you've uh, probably all seen uh, this nice sequence of Yoko images in, in soft x-rays and the corresponding magnetograms that uh, just reinforce the fact that all processes that we know about on the sun are affected by the uh, pattern and presence of these magnetic fields and their cycles. It was already said uh, earlier that the overall field of the sun right now in this cycle is weaker than in the previous cycles for which we have measurements. Shown here are some Wilcox Solar Observatory data. On the top plot, the sine flux in a longitude average way for the last, for the previous three cycles, and on the bottom, the uh, the, the unsigned flux, and what you see is that the butterfly on the lower far right has far fewer contours of field than the other two. And so we, we don't only have to worry about mapping out weak polar fields here. We have to worry about uh, those occasions where we're mapping fields out from the lower latitudes as well. And part of the story also is the multipolar content of the current field. Uh, the dipolar contribution for the, of the three cycles is shown on the top, uh, quadrupolar and, and uh, higher order harmonic on the bottom. And what is happening is that the dipolar contribution uh, is decreased to a greater extent relative to the other uh, higher order harmonics uh, this cycle than in previous cycles. So we have a, a solar field whose largest scales are dominated by somewhat higher order terms than previous. Now, what is the consequence? Uh, our traditional picture of the solar wind is this uh, very nice dipolar solar wind where the solar wind is coming out of the polar regions, polar coronal holes, dark coronal holes, as in this uh, previous cycle image, and filling the heliosphere. 
But this time around, uh, we've had plenty of very large, low latitude, open field regions on the sun, coronal holes. These dark regions are uh, where the solar wind has been emanating from, especially in the 2007-2008 time frame. And this has affected what the heliosphere has experienced. Uh, when we looked at the statistics of the interplanetary uh, contributions to the, uh, from this uh, ecliptic plane field for using the Omni data set at the Goddard Space Flight Center, statistically speaking, what we have here in the middle are statistics of uh, solar wind density and velocity, uh, the density which shows a much lower average density in the red histogram than in the previous minimum in the black histogram from the periods you see at the top. The velocity histogram is not so much different. It's a, it's a typical declining phase solar minimum velocity histogram. And in the bottom are the magnetic field uh, statistics which show uh, correspondingly a weaker magnetic field as has been discussed before. So we do have a situation where in spite of these low latitude coronal holes, we're mapping out weaker magnetic fields, but perhaps this is because the weak field extends throughout the surface of the sun. And Ulysses has found these weak fields and low densities at high latitudes that similarly suggest the general weakness of the, uh, the solar wind that's mapping out. But we have some questions related to how that weakness is uh, originating. Now, the solar wind density and interplanetary field both depend in part on the coronal hole areas, not only uh, the generation mechanism. So one question is, is the amount of photospheric flux and also solar wind flux that's mapping out having to do with changes in coronal hole areas uh, as opposed to changes in the actual generation mechanism? And we can test things with the knowledge we have now. Uh, one of the models we have to use is potential field source surface model. It's not perfect, but it's simple. It allows us to evaluate for any field pattern on the sun, uh, the open and closed field regions, and therefore, presumably, the area of these open field foot points through which the solar wind is reaching us. And we've been able to, with these potential field source surface models, uh, these are based on gong magnetograms, and you can find them on the Gong website on a regular basis if you wonder where today's solar wind is coming from. Uh, you can see that the, on the far right, the sources of ecliptic wind from this period where we've had the low latitude coronal holes is decidedly low, low and mid latitude. It's not coming from the polar regions. So I wish people would expunge from textbooks all these purely dipolar solar wind pictures because they're not generally applicable. There are times like the present where the solar wind really has low latitude sources that are dominating the ecliptic, dominating our solar activity, dominating what we're measuring upstream of the Earth. Another thing we found was that uh, we had to move the source surface of this potential field uh, source surface model closer to the sun. Uh, in the past, it was just presumed to be fixed at two and a half solar radii, and one would be able to get a good picture of the pattern of dark and light in these extreme ultraviolet pictures that show the uh, footprints of the open field regions. But as you see in the circled uh, images here in, on the upper right and lower left, uh, the better match comes from a larger um, coronal hole producing smaller source surface. Here we went to the extreme of one and a half uh, solar radii as opposed to two and a half solar radii. So the, the sun is not only adjusting um, where the open field regions are, but it's adjusting uh, the height of the last closed field line as well. And that has to do with the weakness of the solar field as well. In the end, when we compute over the last two solar minima, uh, what the percent of coronal hole area on the sun is using these two different source surface distances, uh, the top curve shows the fraction of the global sun that is open based on the potential field model for the two source surface heights, the black being the, small, the larger source surface and the red being the smaller source surface. And in theory, we think we're switching from the black, so the black model in the first shaded band on the left with the previous minimum to the red model. 
on the right in, in this minimum. And so we are indeed having a greater area of open flux here in spite of the fact that we might have a smaller coronal hole area. Smaller polar coronal hole area, sorry. And this is what, we, what happens to us if we evaluate the flux that's mapping out when we have this changing source surface. Uh, in the previous minimum, uh, we have the uh, value of the magnetic field or the total flux that's shown within the black shaded region on the second panel. And on the right, we would jump to the red curve. And so we still have diminishment of the interplanetary flux, but it's less of a diminishment than it would be if the solar source surface had stayed the same location. So the sun has somewhat compensated for the fact that it's producing um, this weaker field as far as the interplanetary field is concerned by giving us a larger area of, of open field region and therefore more interplanetary flux than we would have if it had its its old behavior in terms of the last closed field line and the height of the source surface. So we can't just assume that the sun is behaving the same in every minimum. And this minimum has taught us that we should look closely with all the tools we have to understand the way field is mapping out and where it's mapping out from, uh, rather than assuming it's as it was in the past. And here I'm just iterating on the fact that the source surface compensation is there. So uh, in spite of all of these uh, calculations and assum assumptions and trying to understand where the interplanetary field is coming from, this cycle, and how it's being controlled by what's happening on the sun, the fact of the matter is it's still going down. And even though we potentially have these little flurries of activity, uh, so far, it hasn't been enough to turn things around. Uh, the, the mechanisms that are causing flux to uh, decay on the surface, to shift around, are still making a net loss of flux and interplanetary flux. And you can see on the uh, geomagnetic index plot on the lower right uh, from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center that uh, it looks like it's not heading back up uh, in the in any uh, realizable or arguable way, in spite of the fact that we have had these recent flurries of activity. Uh, so I think that we, we do, uh, do think that there is a solar cycle, but we don't know how low this one will go. And so those of you who have models that are based on interplanetary field magnitudes, magnetospheric models, ionospheric models, might want to start playing with one nanotesla interplanetary fields to see how they change their behavior. It might be a very interest, interesting experiment that would be predictive at the same time. I don't think we fully appreciate the importance of coupling to all these systems that the interplanetary field plays and how much a change of that magnitude, how much difference that will make. So I think that's about it. And of course, the galactic cosmic ray flux will keep going up and perhaps the, uh, the question of whether cloud cover is altered at all might be revealed in the end. So the bottom lines are here and they essentially repeat what I say. I, I don't know if I have time to read through these. Uh, the uh, inference of interplanetary conditions from solar observations requires some care in considering how different features of the photosphere map out. Uh, there are coronal hole area considerations. There are considerations of the locations of the coronal holes and where they are mapping to on the surface and what kind of flux is contained in those open field regions. And we should bring all this knowledge to bear on this current solar minimum. Uh, the solar minimum is affected by the larger relative contribution of higher order spherical harmonics to the large scale coronal field and by an apparently smaller source surface for the solar wind, which partially counteracts the effect of the weaker flux. Uh, the causes of the reduced surface magnetic field from the dynamo are still to be determined. The dynamo might be happily cranking away flux in the solar interior and maybe the delivery system that's bringing it up to where it, it, we can see it and where it affects the corona is what's changing. I don't think that we understand the generation of, of the solar field sufficiently well and the internal activity of the sun sufficiently well yet to be able to make that distinction. And I'm hoping that 
missions like SDO might bring to bear on this question. And it's a very timely experiment if we can get it up there and working. So thank you and uh, stay tuned. We might have a session on uh, the, the effect of one nanotesla fields on <laughs> solar planetary interactions on the next union session. Thanks. The question was, what would happen to the Earth's, uh, in the Earth's magnetosphere? And well, the solar wind interaction would be obviously be a lot weaker. Even in a northward interplanetary field case, we have Lobry connection that does a lot of circulation. So I expect your convection systems would collapse. Uh, you would have uh, valve shock would move outward. Valve shock would well. It depends. Sometimes it moves in with the weak field. So uh, I think that it bears some, you know, back of the envelope calculations at a minimum on everyone's part because your, uh, you know, your gut feeling may not be correct. Uh, but we we would certainly learn uh, how much uh, how important it is to measure the interplanetary field to keep track of it and to understand how it's generated if we saw that the effects were great. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next paper is by, given by Len Berlaga, it's a contributed paper, Radio and Solar Cycle Variation in Magnetic Fields in the Heliosheet, Void 1 Observation from 2005 to 2008. Uh, this is an application of the observations that solar activity is declining and the uh, corresponding interplanetary magnetic field is decreasing. We were actually studying the magnetic fields in the helio sheath, uh, which by the way are very weak and we surely don't want any weaker magnetic fields out there, so I hope Janet's wrong about that. But we were expecting to see that the magnet. Okay, next slide here. We were expecting to see that the magnetic field strength would increase with increasing distance into the helio sheath, that is to say with increasing time. Um, so the the top panel shows the magnetic field strength measured by Voyager 1 from just behind the crossing of the termination shock in 2005 out as far as we have processed the data in 2008.8. .8. And as I said, we were expecting, based on quasi-stationary models of the helio sheath, that the magnetic field strength would increase with increasing time. And uh, we found that, in fact, it's decreasing. So the question is, why should the magnetic field strength be decreasing with something missing in those models? Now, I'm going to come back to that uh, question but since I have this slide showing the angles, I want to digress a moment to show that here uh, is the azimuthal angle of the magnetic field as a function of time. You can see a sector pattern over here, but around 2006.23 or so, you start to see uh, basically a unipolar field with some exceptions. And the reason for that is shown in the next slide. Uh, this is the maximum latitude of the heliospheric current sheet that was computed from solar magnetic field observations uh, by Neil Sheely and Yiming Wang. Uh, they uh, calculate the neutral line on the source surface, and then we just project it out to the position of Voyager. And what this says is that there was a change in about 2006.3 years or so in which uh, the helio sphere current sheet dropped below the latitude of Voyager 1. And that would explain the unipolar regions uh, that we, the uniform polarity that we saw after that time. So basically this tells us that we should have been below the, we, the spacecraft should have been above the heliosphere current sheet after that period of time. 
Those occasional exceptions of the polarity to what we expect here are presumably due to northward flows that were observed in the Helios sheath. Next slide. Now I'm returning to the question is of why we didn't see the magnetic field strength increase uh, with time and distance in the Helios sheath. And just to orient you, these are the last sunspot numbers for the last three solar cycles. These are the magnetic field strengths observed at 1 AU during the last three solar cycles. And now you can see these are uh, basically yearly averages. This is the cycle that we're uh, currently in. And you can see that the field is decreasing to very weak values. This is 0.4, I mean, 4 nanoteslas at one astronomical unit, which is probably the weakest we've ever seen. And you can see that a, a one uh, nanotesla field would be pretty dramatic on a scale like this. The next slide shows this last panel just repeated. This is the current cycle. And uh, the important thing here is that I've shifted it uh, to this position of Voyager 1. So I've shown the Voyager 1 observations of the magnetic field strength here. And at this point, there's a termination shock where we see the uniform fields that I described. But before the termination shock, you can see that the magnetic fields at 1 AU were uh, basically reproduced at these very large distances of 100 astronomical units. So you might expect that to happen in some respect afterwards. So here, when we were in the helio sheath, the magnetic field at 1 AU was decreasing. And we should really take into account that decrease. In other words, while we're in the helio sheath, expecting to see an increase in the magnetic field, there's a temporal effect that we have to consider because of this peculiar solar cycle. The next slide uh, shows how we actually make this correction. Uh, you have to basically calculate what the field should be doing in front of the termination shock. And for this purpose, I use Parker's model of the magnetic field as a function of time or distance. Uh, his curve is a solid curve, which follows the predictions very w the observations very well. These are the dots. And the extrapolation for the magnetic field while we were in the helio sheath is shown here. So you can see, indeed, there was a uh, tendency for the magnetic field strength to decline in the absence of a termination shock. And you do have to consider that decreasing solar activity effect, the decreasing magnetic field strength, when you're calculating the radial gradients of the heliosheath magnetic field. So we take this observed nearly constant, slightly decreasing magnetic field. We correct it for the changes in the uh, magnetic field expected as a result of the decreasing solar activity. And we arrive at the result in the next slide, there is indeed, after you make this correction, a radial gradient of the magnetic field strength. And the magnitude of this radial gradient agrees uh, with that which is predicted, for example, by a recent paper by Pogarella et al. So indeed, the magnetic field strength, if you uh, consider it quasi-stationary conditions, is increasing as we move through the helio sheath toward the heliopause. And the next slide shows the summary. This is the gradient of the magnetic field. It's somewhere between 0.0017 nanoteslas and uh, 0.005 nanoteslas per AU. As I said, the predictions are consistent with that. I also made that point that V1, Voyager 1, has above, been above the uh, maximum latitude of the current sheet and uh, observing uniform magnetic fields from the north polar coronal holes with some exceptions due to the northward flows. Thank you. in there somewhere. There we go. Uh, let's see, where's my uh, control thing here? Okay. 
Yeah, I'll be talking about observations of anomalous and galactic cosmic rays during the last several solar minima, in fact. And I'll be limiting the topic to the observations. I'll leave the interpretations and the uh, meaning of this all to the theorists and modelers and people with more expertise in this field, or at least people that have lived through more solar minima than I actually have. Um, just to be sure everybody's all on the same page, this is the record of galactic cosmic rays at 1 AU, as measured by a neutron monitor, in this case the Newark neutron monitor, for the last several solar cycles. And during the a positive solar minima, which is when the uh, magnetic field at the pole of the north pole of the sun is coming outwards. The time profiles of the GCRs tend to be flat and broad and last for quite a while, whereas when the polarity is reversed at A negative, like we're in now, uh, you tend to get a very spiky sort of thing like this. Uh, for comparison, shown on the right axis here and plotted upside down just to confuse you, is the sunspot number during the same time. And what you see is that typically, it's the most easier seen at these a negative minima, typically the sunspot minimum leads the modulation minima or the GCR maxima by about a year or so. And so if the experts are right and sunspot minimum really occurred in December 2008, and I think the jury's probably still out on that, uh, then we ought to be entering modulation minimum right about now. Now I'm showing the Newark neutron monitor here just because that happened to be the one I used, but of course there's many other neutron monitors to choose from. Not as many as there used to be, unfortunately, but still quite a few. And uh, if you compare them, here's just a sample of some of them scaled as power laws and laid on top of each other. Some of them actually go back further in time than Newark does, and you see the, the last part of this A negative cycle here and part of the A positive. Uh, when scaled in this manner, they actually all agree with each other fairly well during this last A negative, but if you look carefully, you see that by the time you get to the present here and even up into this last uh, solar minimum, there starts to be some divergence. For the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'll let that to the neutron monitor experts to discuss and worry about and argue about. Uh, the main point is that I think everybody agrees that at the present time here, at the very end of this run, uh, we are at the highest GCR intensity, certainly for this solar minimum, and in many cases, and for most of these uh, observers at least, the highest we've seen in about 50 years or so. Another way of looking at this is if you consider the solar modulation parameter phi, this is from work of Usoskin et al., who uses a network of neutron monitors, including many that I haven't actually shown you and not including Newark, and they too find that at present the modulation level for galactic cosmic rays is the lowest seen in 50 years. So we're definitely at a, a very deep solar minimum. Uh, another indicator, not so much of the severity of the solar minimum, but at least of its timing, is shown here by the uh, co-rotating interaction region particles. In his Parker lecture, Len Berlaga describes CIRs. Uh, High-speed solar wind streams, such as these ones here, overtake and interact with slower speed streams, and uh, shocks form, particles get accelerated. These here are about uh, two to six uh, MeV protons measured by stereo over the last several years. And you see, even during this, what's otherwise a quiet period, I mean, we haven't seen a big SEP event in three years now, otherwise quiet period, we've had regularly occurring uh, increases in energetic particles due to co-rotating interaction regions until about this year. And now even those have pretty much died down. The intensities are much lower. The frequency is much lower. Uh, not surprisingly, at the same time, the drivers of these CIRs, the high-speed streams, have become eh, mediocre speed streams at best. They're just struggling to reach 500 kilometers per second. So the sun has definitely gotten quiet in terms of particles. So the wind has quieted down. CIRs have quieted down. GCRs are way up. What about the anomalous cosmic rays, ACRs? Well, these are data here from the ACE mission, which was launched at the tail end of the last solar minimum. These are anomalous cosmic rays, uh, relatively low energy oxygen here from the CIS instrument, and you see that at present, this is where our intensities are at. This is where they were at the end of the last solar minimum. ACR intensities have not yet recovered at 1 AU to where they were at the end of the last solar minimum. GCRs, on the other hand, in this case several hundred MeV per nucleon iron from another instrument on ACE, again, are elevated from where they were. And both these panels I compare with the neutron monitor values by scaling as a power law, and I guess I am using Newark, and it agrees pretty well here with the uh, CRIS data, the GCRs here. If you want to pick one of these other neutron monitors that come out a little bit lower, great. You'll probably get better agreement here, but you cannot make it agree here. It, when, it's, when it's tracked such that it agrees nicely here at the uh, last solar minimum, there's a big discrepancy at this one. And it starts somewhere down around here, near the last solar maximum, about the time of the polarity reversal. Now. Uh, there are other ACR species, too. In the interest of fairness, I should show you them rather than just show you different neutron monitors but not the ACRs. Uh, here's helium, nitrogen, and oxygen, uh, ni helium, nitrogen, and neon. 
and uh, here they are all overlaid on each other with oxygen. I've not subtracted the GCR background, so they all kind of bottom out at different levels here, but you see that they all track each other pretty well, and in fact, the main point is none of them have recovered to what their levels were at the last solar minimum. So, is that usual or unusual? Actually, <laughs> one of the earlier speakers mentioned that some of these things don't, we don't have a long record for. Well, we have the extra handicap in that since it's a significant difference between the two polarity cycles, we have effectively half the number of records that some other people do. But it seems to be usual. This is the ACR intensity, again, the ACE data that I showed you, extending back in time using SAMPEX and some earlier missions like uh, the IMPS and OGOs. And the neutron monitor scaled on top of it. And you see that the same scaling that I used between the two that works well here worked fine during the last A positive cycle. This isn't working in this A negative cycle and apparently didn't work in the last one either. Fewer, a sparser number of ACR data points, but seems to be falling short there too. What we find at 1AU is that at A negative cycles, the GCRs have a higher peak intensity than at A positive cycles. In the outer heliosphere, that's true for the ACRs as well. The ACRs are factors of several higher at A negative cycles than at A positive. At 1AU, that doesn't seem to be the case. Certainly, it's not true here, unless we haven't quite gotten up there yet. But in this case, too, it looks like ACRs are actually lower in peak intensity at A negative cycles at 1AU than at A positive. So if I can't scale it like this, uh, what, what, how are these two related here, the uh, ACRs and GCRs? Well, if I just simply plot one versus the other, this is the ACRs here, GCRs here, log log scale. You see, it's basically a line. That's where I get the, the power law index of 30 that I was showed in the other plot from the uh, decline from 1997 down to solar max. It's bounced around down here for a while and it's coming back up along essentially the same slope line. The index has not changed. The offset has. So all the differences in modulation between the positive and negative cycles, whatever they boil down to, at 1AU basically boils down to a change in the scale factor between the two in some fashion. How does this compare to the longer term historical record? Well, you can take a look, although again the data is a little sparser. This is the plot you saw before. If I split the data at the maxima and plot effectively the same sort of hysteresis loops, if you will, this is the one we just saw. We start here, come down, come back up. Uh, the last a positive to negative transition here looks something like this. I didn't put the error bars on. This obviously bounced around a lot, but it looks pretty similar. Same direction of change, uh, basically the same slope. The one in between, between the negative and positive, the direction is reversed. And if you put all this together and changing the directions with the different polarities and taking into account the fact that you peak at different values with the uh, ACRs peaking at positive and the, rather than negative and the GCRs going the other way, you basically get, at least what, in a cartoon fashion, looks topologically like a figure eight. You go around the loop at the positive cycle in one direction, negative in the other, and you connect together like that. So if I were to predict what's going to happen once and when this starts coming down, if it starts coming down, it's not going to close the loop. It's not going to retrace its step. It's going to kind of split the difference between the two and come down like that. Am I right? Check back in a couple of years. So most of what I've been showing you has been all types of particles at one particular energy. Is some of this an energy dependent effect? The GCRs that I've been showing are up at GeV energies or hundreds of MeV energies. The ACRs are down at a couple tens of MeV. Is it energy dependent? I would say no. Here are spectra for six different species from ACE, three of which have a large ACR component, oxygen, nitrogen, and neon, three which don't, carbon, silicon, and iron. And I'm showing you two spectra in each case, one in lighter colors taken from the beginning of the ACE mission, the tail end of the last solar max, uh, the solar min, and one using recent data up to about a month ago or so shown in the darker color. And you see the ACRs themselves, the new stuff, the dark stuff, hasn't quite gotten up to where it was before for either oxygen or nitrogen or neon. But the, by the time you get to the higher end of the spectrum where the GCRs dominate, they're all higher. And that's true even for these GCR species that don't have an ACR component. That is, if you go down to 20 or 30 MeV per nuke carbon, not only have those GCRs recovered, they are actually elevated compared to where they were last time. So here's these, on the bottom is the ratio of the old stuff, of the new stuff to the old stuff. You see a constant, well, essentially constant across the board, 20% or so enhancement for all these species for the GCRs. It gets a little noisy down here, but if you follow the carbon line, it's, it's not inconsistent with it. And the, while at the same time the ACRs are down at mm, 85, 90% or so of the level they were at the last solar min. So what's causing all this? Well, in some of the earlier talks this week, we heard various things. In fact, in some of the earlier talks this session, we heard about the changes in the B field at the sun, and some of the other talks emphasize the changes in the B field in interplanetary space. That undoubtedly plays a role. 
Uh, there are, of course, differences in the dynamics uh, pressure of the solar wind and the speed. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of CMEs going on these days anymore. I can't discuss all these things in the time available, but I will mention uh, changes in the tilt of the heliospheric current sheet, uh, partly because uh, a lot of the work was done by our distinguished co-chair here. Um, Jacoby and Thomas back in 81 pointed out that during A negative cycles, the drift direction of charged particles, positively charged particles, into the inner heliosphere is along the heliospheric current sheet. It's reversed during A negative cycles. They come in from the poles, go out along the current sheet. And so the ease of access to the inner heliosphere depends on the tilt angle. The larger the tilt angle, the bigger the amplitude of this wiggle that gets generated, the longer the path length, the more difficult it is for particles to get in. What's the tilt angle been doing lately? Well, this is data from the Wilcox Solar Observatory. Uh, people, other people have shown the magnetic field measurements from Wilcox. This is my rendition of that. But um, this is the tilt angle from the Hil Wilcox Solar Observatory over the last few cycles. Again, it only goes back three cycles, but we'll take what we can get. Uh, in all previous cases, the rise has been fairly rapid, and it's decayed back down to low tilt angles You know, on this kind of time scale. Here, I've got dashed lines on there just done by eye. This is what it's doing now. It's coming down a lot more slowly. That's a lot more dramatic if you actually lay these on top of each other, like this. Cycle 21 in blue, 22 in red, and the most recent cycle in black. They all rose to peak tilt angle with basically the exact same rate. And the last two cycles came down more or less the same. Lots of fluctuations, but they sort of started at the same point, ended at the same point, and took about as long to get there. This present cycle started coming down at about the same rate and then decided to really slow itself down. And it's a little sobering to realize that by this point in time, in the last two solar cycles, this part, this part, uh, this late in time since the onset of the, of the tilt angle increase, we were well into solar max, and now we're just barely getting into solar min. So the sun is running way behind schedule, hopefully not like this session might be. So given that uh, the high tilt angle tends to block the ACRs from coming in, and given that it's been high until recently, does that explain why you get relatively low ACR intensities? Sounds plausible, but never wanted to leave well enough alone. Decided to take a look and check it out. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on this plot, but you've seen some of it before. The red data is the ACR intensities on this scale. The blue data is the scaled neutron monitor overlaid on top of it, just as you've seen before. And now I've added the tilt angle in a thick black line, plotted again upside down here on this axis. Now, if you look at this last A negative here, the black line from the tilt angle and the blue from the neutron monitor are in great agreement with each other, almost wiggle for wiggle. It's not surprising. That's what they're supposed to be doing. The agreement actually even lasts well into this A-positive cycle here. And it really starts deviating about the time you come out of the A-positive minimum and go into the next maximum. And that makes sense because at that point in time, the particles are coming in from the polar regions. They don't much care what's going on down in the ecliptic at the low latitudes. The current sheet comes up relatively rapidly. The particles only reluctantly sort of drop off. And they did much the same sort of thing at the tail end of the last A-positive cycle that we had. OK, so that's the last A-negative cycle. Here's what we have now. Uh, Nothing is agreeing with anything else anymore. <laughs> the, uh, the way it's been plotted here, the, the blue neutron monitor and the tilt angle are lying on top of each other. So if we look at the given tilt angle now, the GCRs are well above where they were for that same tilt angle during the last day negative. The ACRs are plotted here at about the same level, or maybe a little bit below. Here, again, for the same tilt angle, the ACRs are actually high. In an absolute sense, the ACRs are about normal, maybe even a little on the low side. But for a given tilt angle, which is supposed to dominate the ACR transport, they're actually high this time around, too. So something has changed in the scaling between the neutron monitor, the tilt angle, and the ACRs in this cycle. And this change occurred back here. Yeah, it's a really quiet solar min. Yeah, the solar wind is down. There's not much going on or anything like that. This change in the scaling started back here around solar max about the time that the polarity reversed. So I don't know what it is, but I would like an explanation for this from the, the modelers, the theorists, and anybody who's able to provide one. So to summarize, the ACR intensities are about where they should be compared to the last solar minima. Uh, maybe, but they certainly took a good long time to get there. GCRs are effectively at record highs for the space age, at least, as although, as we heard in other talks, they've probably been a whole lot higher in the distant past. Uh, the uh, scaling between the ACRs and neutron monitors is different from what it was in the last solar minimum, the A-positive solar minimum, but it seems like that's typical. That doesn't seem necessarily to be unusual. Uh, it's not due to an energy-dependent effect, at least in the sense that the low-energy GCRs are elevated from where they were. ACRs are depleted. 
something definitely changed between the scaling, between the uh, tilt angle and the particle intensity since the last cycle. Both ACR and GCR intensities are high for a given tilt angle compared to where they were last time. Uh, these changes in the, in, the interplanet in the interplanetary conditions, the B field, the solar wind speed, et cetera, certainly have to have something to do with this. It's very easy to see that all these things go in the direction such as it's going to be easier for particles to get in, so the GCR uh, transport should be much easier. That probably explains why you get the GCRs higher. It's not so trivial to figure out what it does for the ACR since they're effectively local. They're accelerated presumably at the termination shock or in the heliopause or somewhere nearby. That's all thrown into a hat too because of the whole new IBEX measurements and the Voyager measurements in terms of figuring out exactly how and where the ACRs are coming from. But they're local. If you change the interstellar per, interplanetary parameters, what does that do to the, the source of the ACRs? What does it do to their acceleration efficiencies, the size of the region, the source intensity? Does it go up? Does it go down by how much? I think working that out will probably give the answer to why these things are tracking the way they are, but I think that's still work that needs to be done, and that's where the challenge still lies. I'm going to echo our first speaker and say I'm not going to try to predict what's going to happen, uh, given what we're seeing now. It's going to be interesting to watch and find out what's going to happen, and uh, probably if you check back in a couple of years, we'll at least have some better idea what's going on then. Thanks very much. Um, so the question was, the heliosphere is presumably smaller because the dynamic pressure is lower, and from what's known about radial gradients, should that have an effect? I, I think you have to take all the pieces together, including the Voyager measurements, which are done out near the outer boundary of the heliosphere or beyond. And um, I, I think the fact that some of these changes took place back at solar max makes me... I, I'm sure the, the reduced pressure is going to have an effect if it hasn't already. I'm not sure how much it has already because of the fact that this changed early. And uh, it could be a chicken and the egg thing, you know. Is, it, is the pressure reduced because of whatever the ultimate driver is that's doing this, or is that going to have even bigger effects later on? Maybe it's a fancy way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, we'll go to the next talk. The contributed talk. Usual time history of galactic and anomalous cosmic rays in the heliosphere of the deep total minimum of cycle 2324. Frank McDonald and a bunch of co authors presented by Frank. Yeah, my unindicted co conspirators there. Uh, when I gave a talk on this subject at the AGU, mainly to a group of people in, so, uh, in solar physics last year, they assured me that if I would just wait a couple of months, this would all change and not to worry about it. And so here we are closing out 2009, that despite the fact that there's a strong active region close to central meridian this morning, uh, is still on, <clears throat> on its way to becoming one of the quietest, solar, <coughs> quietest years solar-wise in the last century. Uh, and what it does is it's a true blessing for those of us who do modulation studies because we get a whole new look at the heliosphere and solar modulation. Next slide. Uh, mainly I want to, uh, this deep continuing solar minimum, uh, we can quantify the effects of reducing the strength of the interplanetary magnetic field. There are transient changes in the current sheet tilt angle that, and it should lead to a better understanding of the unusual <coughs> uh, epochs in the past of, of paleocosmic ray activity. Next slide. Uh, Rick it, <coughs> did a great job of sort of <coughs> covering all of this. The thing I would like to emphasize is just what a repetitive pattern we've had in the past. Uh, here I show the helium spectra for uh, four solar cycles. Uh, <coughs> sort of 19, 20, 21, and 22. The top one's uh, helium in blue there. You see that the, <coughs> uh, the strong suppression, <coughs> you see it, one, that they agree with each other in the even cycles. And then for the odd cycles, there's the strong suppression at low energies, 
you come up and there's an extensive region that starts around 200 MeV that extends above 500 MeV where the modulation is the same no matter what the polarity is over these <laughs> and you see exactly the same pattern. And it, next slide. If you go to neutron monitors, you see that the QA negative cycles neutron monitors are always three to four percent higher. So what this means is low energies have to follow along the fuel line. They're constrained to follow the fuel lines coming up in QA negative and they're strongly dependent as Rick showed <coughs> on tilt angle. Uh, High energies simply just cut through them and don't worry as much. And you have that intermediate range, which is the, the crossover range. Uh, the other thing one sees is, it's been emphasized by several people today, that you have a, what's essentially a floor in the past of the minimum value of the magnetic field around five nanoteslas. In the next slide. This looks now at, at the uh, cycle 22, 23. Uh, if you look at the top, there is the uh, 200 MeV helium. Uh, we use two data sets. One is imp 8 The other is from ACE, which is a normalized oxygen data. And uh, they overlap exceedingly well. Uh, imp 8 uh, was lost in the... Uh, in 2006, and we, but we see the continuation and you see the increase. You see, as it was shown previously, uh, the carbon, uh, low energy carbon, 8 to 18 MeV, uh, is not really, is back to its same level and the suppression of oxygen. What, and it, uh, Kiel, the neutron monitor, is a sort of a fraction of a percent up, <coughs> Uh, a couple of percent here above its 80, 96 level, and uh, the, the magnetic field begins dropping very steadily here and is down now. Uh, so, uh, roughly uh, today, it's sort of uh, last monthly average is 28 percent below the previous minimum. So, the mag and the, <coughs> the tilt angle is just approaching where it was. So all of these changes that we see in galactic cosmic rays are very clear. It's the, interplanet it's the changes in the interplanetary magnetic field that produces the increase in the galactic cosmic rays. This is, is both the strength of the field, possible turbulence, and so. And uh, we can look at this in a, a different way. Next slide. If we simply take the <coughs> red, which is the uh, data <coughs> back peaks in 87 there, the <coughs> uh, cycle 21, 22 data, and uh, compare it, slide that forward by 20 years. And what one sees is that uh, things behave exactly the, <coughs> the same uh, as far as galactic cosmic rays and anomalous cosmic rays through about 2007. Uh, and <clears throat> then you take off as the field, as the magnetic field gets weaker. Uh, the big change occurs in this <clears throat> so-called, uh, uh, <clears throat> the transition region, uh, uh, the crossover region. Uh, <clears throat> you see this 30% uh, increase from 87 to the present, uh, the increase from <coughs> uh, 96, 97 is 17 percent, uh, which is in very close agreement with the <coughs> uh, 19 percent increase that, uh, that the ACE people reported for iron. We find the Kiel neutron monitor is, <coughs> is sort of 1 percent higher now compared to uh, 96 and the large deficit in oxygen. And which I think this is quite understandable what's going on. Uh, namely, that you, the, there's a lag of about three months or four months, uh, and one would expect, a, I would predict that uh, two months from now, 
the, uh, uh, three months from now, the oxygen will be up to its level in 87. <clears throat> and I would also, uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we will have to wait and see. Uh, skip the next one. Okay, now we go to Voyager. Uh, the top one is high energy helium, 150 to 400 MeV helium. Uh, and what you see after the vertical lines here are the termination shock crossings, Voyager 1, Voyager 2. What you see at Voyager 1, you recover from solar maximum conditions, and then it's been a steady increase at the rate of something like 7.5% per year. If we look at, um, which we don't show here, if you look at 200 MeV helium out there, it's increasing at 9.6% per year. And uh, so uh, two-thirds of the increase that we see at 1 AU are due to the ter magne magnetic fuel changes in the outer heliosphere. And the really surprising thing is the, t is the electrons shown at the bottom, uh, which are increasing at 80% per year. Uh, in the next slide, one actually sees there's a fair correlation between these GCR low energy electrons the, uh, and the galactic cosmic rays, uh, galactic electrons. And uh, the question is, how do these get in when you've got a magnetic pole? In the next slide, uh, so to say, I mean, you've got 10 MeV galactic electrons increasing. You've got no radial intensity gradients for uh, helium out there. Okay, uh, and uh, there's supposed to be a, <coughs> a strong magnetic wall. Two possibilities. The, the, the magnetic wall is much more permeable than expected, or these particles are going, coming up the tail. Skip the next one. Skip. Uh, yes, yeah, skip. Okay, and there's, so we would say the changes are seen are the changes that have taken place in the interplanetary magnetic field and in, in, in its relation. Uh, the tilt angle changes are important in the ACR and the high energies, and it takes a long while for this magnetic field to reach out to the he, he, <coughs> into the helio sheet, uh, so we should see this for a while. And uh, it, it means also we have to change our concepts about modulation because a significant amount of the modulation changes occurring in the helio sheet uh, where you don't have adiabatic energy losses. So thank you. The talk of the session is uh, my esteemed co-presider here, uh, Professor Randy Jacopi, who, uh, as the uh, cosmic ray theorist, has the task of telling us all what this means. Uh, so uh, Randy's title is Interpreting Cosmic Rays in the Current Anomalous Sunspot Minimum. Yeah, I need, I need my you slides. Need slides. Uh, OK, I hope I don't disappoint. I'm going to give everybody here a feeling for the tools we're going to use to try to interpret this stuff, but I don't have many answers right now. I put Joseph Coda as a co-author because much of the work I'm going to talk about has been done in collaboration with him. So what I'm going to be talking about is basic theoretical underpinnings of what's going on. Next slide, please. So my, I'll give you a brief uh, review. I'm going to concentrate on galactic cosmic rays in this talk because they're probably the most important uh, as far as the consequences are concerned. I'll give a brief review of current anomalous sunspot minimum. I don't need to do that, so I'll go through that quickly. We have had a lot of information on that. I'll talk about galactic cosmic rays, and I will try to summarize our current view of the basic physics and point out that uh, right now we are just beginning to see the cosmic ray increases that we expect, and so any detailed interpretation is probably premature at this stage 
Uh, so I'll try and discuss how that might go and discuss some implications. Next slide. So what I'm going to talk about today is the, uh, the galactic cosmic rays, which are illustrated in this slide, the uh, protons and helium. The dash line is uh, an indication of transient solar particle events, which also play a role. These are, this is the cosmic ray intensity seen outside of the Earth's magnetosphere, and this entire turnover at low energies is what we call uh, solar modulation galactic cosmic rays caused by uh, the solar wind flowing out from the sun. Now this, these galactic cosmic rays are the environment of the Earth, are significant part of the Earth's environment in space, and it's important to understand what it's likely to do in the future, particularly with respect to uh, man, man's exploration of space. This is a significant hazard to man in space. But also, we would like to understand how this change occurs so we can use proxy indicators of uh, cosmic rays in the past to try and see what the sun and climate was doing in the past. The uh, current sunspot minimum, my position is that it's a great opportunity for us, unless it really gets bad, uh, for us to study these phenomena in a new parameter regime and hopefully understand the whole process a lot better. Uh, next slide. So we're talking about the heliosphere. This is a uh, poor man's drawing. Uh, we have the sun, the solar wind flowing out, the magnetic field, and we have the outer parts of the heliosphere. And the idea is that the galactic cosmic rays come to us from the galaxy. They're pretty much impeded till they get to the uh, contact surface and possibly even inside of that. And mainly the solar wind inside in the inner parts of the heliosphere uh, tries to keep the cosmic rays out, but they leak in along the magnetic field and to some extent across the magnetic field. As Frank pointed out, the, uh, the current models are beginning to show us that there is almost certainly significant changes in the cosmic ray intensity between the uh, outside uh, interstellar medium and the termination shock, which is called the heliosheath. This is called the heliosheath. And we are, the models do show significant changes there, and that's perhaps, uh, uh, or as Frank was saying, that may be a big player in all that's happening. Next slide. So this is a, I just want to show you the complexity of this region. Please don't try to interpret it all. But we, this is another similar drawing to the, the previous simple one. We have here the contact surface. We have the solar wind flowing out. We have the termination shock. And we have the solar wind flowing beyond the termination shock being blown around behind. And we have the interstellar medium being turned around. All this plays a role in what happens to galactic cosmic rays as they come into the heliosphere. The general feeling right now is probably it's good to keep the interstellar intensity, which we don't really know, below a few hundred MeV, uh, equal to what it is throughout the galaxy into perhaps the, uh, this contact surface. However, it is certainly possible that the uh, transport in the interstellar medium locally is sufficiently impeded that we might actually have consequences for of the heliosphere even outside beyond the, uh, the bow shock or the, uh, the heliosheath. Uh, I'm not going to address that here. Next slide. The tool that we feel is certainly adequate to handle this is the Parker transport equation written down in the mid-60s by Gene Parker in a slightly different form, but the physics was all there. And the basic idea is that uh, the cosmic rays we see are essentially isotropic in pitch angle. They're coming in all directions. And this equation makes use of that to uh, derive a transport equation for the isotropic part of the distribution. Places where the anisotropies are large, this is not the proper equation to use. But for galactic cosmic rays in particular, and indeed the anomalous cosmic rays, that's not an issue. So this is the equation we feel uh, behaves, uh, gives the behavior. Uh, this term here involving the divergence of the flow velocity contains all of the energy change. The electric field, the effects of the electric fields in the heliosphere changing the energy is all contained in this divergence of U. Uh, because in MHD, the magnetic field and the uh, flow velocity to deter determine the electric field. And added here are the drift velocities, which I'll discuss later. This is the gradient and curvature drifts. And I want to emphasize here, if I forget to do it later, that 
the major transport terms bringing the cosmic rays in are the diffusion, this is a random walk of the particles through the turbulent magnetic field, and these gradient and curvature drifts. Both of those transport effects depend essentially on the inverse of the magnetic field. As the magnetic field gets weaker, the drift velocity and the diffusion become more rapid, so the cosmic rays have much more easy access. That's a big player in what we think is happening. And similarly, this is the solar wind convection velocity here. It's the radial flow of the solar wind. And that uh, also is, appears to be quite low. And that is the thing that also that acts to impede the particles from coming in as well. So we have basically uh, two major effects. Well, there are three. If we look at it a different way, I'll show you that in a minute. But the drift velocities, the diffusion and coefficient, which depend both uh, get bigger if the magnetic field gets weak and the flow velocity of the solar wind. Next slide. So this is a cartoon illustrating these effects that come from the Parker equation. Uh, in this, uh, this, I would call this, I guess, an amber line. These are the drift velocities uh, for the uh, cosmic ray particles. They depend on the sign of the magnetic field. In this particular diagram here, the outer magnetic, the, out, the northern uh, heliosphere magnetic field is outward from the sun. The southern hemisphere, the yeah, southern component is inward from the, inward toward the sun, and the drifts have this sign. They come in over both poles, and they move outward along the current sheet. The, if we go to the next sunspot minimum, uh, the drifts are in the opposite direction. They come in along the current sheet, and this has been discussed by previous authors. This is based on solid physics. These are physically uh, very sound properties. The particles at the same time are meandering or wa random walk in and out of the heliosphere. Most of them come in for a while and go back out. Some make it in far to be seen. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry. The, the other thing shown here is the outer boundary, which in all of the simulations that I'm going to talk about is taken to be a sphere corresponding roughly to the, uh, the, uh, the, um, boy, I've got a block here the heliopause, and we, we do carry our calculations out through the heliopause, but in this rather simplified geometry. The geometries are getting more complex as time goes on, and I, but I'm not going to discuss those in detail. I'm going to go into the basic physics here. Okay, so we're uh, solving the Parker equation in this quasi-spherical geometry, but it's clearly not spherical. We have this current sheet, we have the drift velocities, and we impose outside at this outer boundary the uh, presumed galactic cosmic ray intensity, which is assumed not to change in time. All the time variations come from changes in the solar wind. By the way, that's almost certainly a good approximation for any changes on less than about 10,000 years. Uh, next slide. So this is a slightly more complicated version of that figure. You've seen Rick Lesky showed this earlier. This shows for the opposite sign of the magnetic field from the previous one. This is where the uh, the, the, the designation is QA less than zero. That means the southern hemisphere magnetic field is out from the sun, corresponds to the present sunspot minimum. The particles come in along the current sheet and are ejected over the poles. Again, these are gradient and curvature drift motions, very well understood. And this is a diagram, three-dimensional projection of the current sheet showing the up and down wiggles, which are shown in projection here. And this whole uh, structure arises from the fact that the uh, dipole or the field which gives rise to this is, uh, has an axis which is inclined to the rotation axis of the sun. Above this current sheet, the magnetic field is a Parker spiral in one direction, and in the south, uh, below the current sheet, there's another sign. And if you're on a spacecraft that is sitting at a given point, as this structure rotates with the rotation of the sun, uh, you are alternately above and below the current sheet. If you're below, uh, this, this angle. This is, for reasons which I forget, called the tilt angle, although it's clearly not tilted. Uh, it is tilted right at the sun, but this is what I call the, the degree of waviness of the current sheet. So again, the particles come in along this and uh, are ejected over the poles at the present time. Yes, next slide. So we can solve Parker's transport equation. There are a number of very sophisticated solutions to this. This is one of the simpler ones. Uh, this was uh, just done a few years ago with a code that I own. Uh, I've shown the anomalous cosmic rays just for uh, contrast. The anomalous cosmic rays 
are accelerated, we think, in the vicinity or near or perhaps in the heliosheath, but they're not coming in from the galaxy. The galactic cosmic rays are coming in from the galaxy. There's a possibility of some increase near the heliospheric uh, termination shock because of a moderate acceleration they undergo there. But basically, uh, most of the time, you expect the, uh, the cosmic rays to continue to increase beyond the termination shock. Pro pr prior to some 20 years ago, uh, people would carry this model only out to the termination shock, but now we know that considerable modulation occurs beyond, and Frank was emphasizing that in his talk earlier. Next slide. This is a little bit more uh, uh, co uh, detailed drawing of the same thing for one sign of the magnetic field here, and for the opposite sign, this is the current. And you can see that at, uh, trying to see what this is, uh, boy, let's see, yeah, different energy particles, uh, plotted uh, as a function of radius. Again, at the lower energies, there's clearly significant increase in the cosmic rays as we go from the termination shock to the boundary. Uh, next slide. Uh, observations on Voyager, uh, in some sense, confirmed what I'm talking about, in other senses did not. These are the anomalous cosmic rays. Ignore the energies. There was a mislabeling of the slides. These are anomalous cosmic rays, which clearly were doing weird things in the outer heliosphere. We still don't fully understand this. This is a debate. But the galactic cosmic rays, if you take account of the fact that there are temporal changes occurring in the solar wind, this is not too far uh, of a dependence if you took it as the radial dependence, although it's just time. Uh, this is a combination of radial and uh, spatial dependence. There's no obvious difficulty with the galactic cosmic rays. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a classic uh, old, fa old cosmic ray modulation uh, calculation of neutron monitors. This is the observed climax neutron monitor for two successive sunspot minima. You see the alternation of the sharply peak and the more rounded peak. And this is a crude uh, model of the same thing where the only thing that was changed was the sign of the magnetic field and the tilt of the current sheet. And you can see that the uh, the intensity was a sharper maximum for current sunspot cycle, current sign of the magnetic field, and more flat. And this was thought to be a reasonably good confirmation of the basic ideas. Next slide. So this is, again, a longer time period, climax neutron monitor. You can see this alternation again where with the magnetic field, uh, where the magnetic field changes sign every 11 years, where the magnetic field was positive in the outward from the sun in the northern hemisphere, we have uh, broader maxima in the cosmic rays and sharper maxima. And we're still waiting to see what happens. Unfortunately, new uh, climax was shut down uh, by the funding agency, and uh, I haven't updated this slide. Uh, next. So the general picture at this point seems to be working well. Increasingly sophisticated numerical simulations are, are, have appeared in the last decade. Uh, 3D, time-dependent, heliosphere, uh, very, very sophisticated, including the evolution of the turbulent fluctuation causing the, the random walk or diffusion of the cosmic rays. Very sophisticated, uh, and basically there are enough knobs to tweak, although the basic phenomena that was uh, done years ago by simpler models is preserved. They are now have knobs for the turbulence and things like that, and they can uh, do self-consistent models, and there is very good agreement with the observations. Uh, these groups have begun to address the current solar minimum, but as I will point out, uh, we really have to wait a while before we can really make a definitive study of this. The question really remains, uh, in my mind, is whether these very, very sophisticated models based on the paradigm that I just discussed, whether that will continue to be adequate or whether we're going to have to have a paradigm shift. Uh, of course, we don't know yet. Next slide. So the current sunspot minimum, it's anomalous, as has been pointed out by many speakers today. It clearly has affected cosmic rays. And as I pointed out, we have an opportunity to increase our understanding by using this as, in a sense, a probe of different areas of, of parameter space. And this will then go back to help us understand how the environment of the Earth with respect to cosmic rays changed in the past in response. And if, once we understand, once we measure these changes using beryllium-10 or other proxy indicators, we can per perhaps understand better what the sun was doing back in those eras and help us to understand the Earth's climate and its variation. Next slide. 
So this is a, a slide I didn't see today, but basically showing the uh, magnitude of the field in sunspots. Bill Livingston, at NRO, uh, printed this slide. I don't have to show most of these. Let's go quickly. So this is another measurement showing the magnetic field went down. Next slide. So what I have emphasized in, in this presentation is a low magnetic field strength and low wind velocity, although as has been pointed out uh, by previous speakers, the waviness or tilt of the current sheet is also a big player in this. So what I have done just, as, just to illustrate the point, what happens is that if the magnetic field or the solar wind velocity or the tilt of the current sheet changes near the sun, it takes a long time for that to get out to the outer heliosphere, which then as the cosmic rays come in, it takes them a long time to come back in, uh, several months perhaps. And so what happens at the uh, sun doesn't change the cosmic ray intensity fully for more than a year. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, this is an illustration of what we're seeing. The cosmic rays are in increasing now in response to the lower magnetic field, but I don't think we've seen the whole thing yet. Next slide. Uh, this is another indication of the uh, beryllium-10 and the fact that we're continuing to go down. Next slide. So what I did was just, uh, this is the first of two slides. Uh, this is a, 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 something I did several years ago showing how changes in the magnetic field, just change, doing nothing more to the model but changing the magnetic field strength. One is the current magnetic field, and these are at, at different energies showing the effect of changing the magnetic field on the cosmic ray intensity. And I think that's a large part of what's happened in the past. The, the magnetic field of the sun has just changed. I have not done the same calculation for the wind velocity, but it's expected to be the same. Next slide illustrates, let's see. First, I wanted to discuss the time scales. If you, you can just do a back of the envelope calculation, if you take the fact that diffusion, diffusive time scales are the length scale squared divided by the kappa, and just take this to be the radial diffusion coefficient, this takes a few years if L is 100 AU. Time for change in solar wind parameters to propagate through the heliosphere is perhaps about a year. Hence, the effects of the anomalous sunspot minimum should perhaps last for perhaps a year or a few years, depending on what energy particle you're talking about and what diffusion coefficient. Next slide. This is just a simple calculation. Ignore the bump. That's just an initial transient. What I did here was uh, do a model with the current sign of the magnetic field and just change the magnetic field at the sun and let that propagate at 400 kilometers per second. This is just a step function decrease in the magnetic field. So we have initially a steady level uh, prior to this decrease, and the decrease propagates out. And you can see that it's taking at, at 200 MeV, it takes perhaps a year and a half or so to reach uh, nearly its maximum. And at lower energies, it takes more time. And so my guess is that we will still be pondering these things in a couple of years. But now is the time to start modeling it and see if we need uh, drastic changes in our models. Next slide. So conclusions, present sunspot minimum is sufficiently abnormal that it tests our understanding of these cosmic ray modulation. We should seize this opportunity to increase our understanding of solar modulation by exploring previously not observed parameter ranges and then understanding the sun and the history of the solar system better. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I, the, the comment was that uh, I should be aware that not only do we have to carry these changes out into the, uh, to the boundaries of the, uh, to the termination shock, but beyond into the heliosheath, and some of these effects can uh, last for more than years, maybe a decade or so. That's true, but the major effects, I think, are in this model, Vladimir, because 
in this model, I do have a slow solar wind beyond the termination shock, and it slows down even more. Uh, I do have a wall similar to the one that you've proposed. And so I'm thinking maybe a few years, but, but certainly some effects will be seen for longer. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking part in this session. I know everybody wanted to get to dinner, yet we still have people here. Thank you very much for staying. And let's maybe come back in a year or two and do the same thing and see where we are at that time. <laughs>